Hi everyone, and welcome to the Gehana Konta podcast, your dose of relaxpiration where we get to meet amazing people from sport, business, entertainment, and just life in general. Welcome back to episode two. In part two, I'll be answering more of your questions as well as finishing my conversation with Claire Williams, deputy team principal of the Williams Racing Formula One team. I'm your host, Johanna Conta, and welcome to episode two, part two. As you probably know by now, ahead of each episode, I'll be asking you to submit questions to me on Twitter or Instagram, where you can find me at Johanna Conta. I started answering some questions in part one of this episode, which if you haven't yet listened to, make sure you go back and check it out now. The first question on my list today is from Peter, who asked, what is the best advice you could give your younger self? Oh, I mean, that's definitely not a short list. (laughs) Um, I think uh, more than anything, it's patience. Um, I think especially when I was younger, I was just really impatient and really eager to have things happen and have things happen now and I think as the more time I spent in this sport and the more trials and difficulties and um, hardships that I endured I think the more it taught me that first of all nothing's guaranteed and, and actually for me to enjoy the space that I'm in now so to not keep just wanting what's next and to really appreciate the here and now so I think patience and then along with that it's um to stay present yeah so yeah i'd probably say to my younger self have patience and be present (laughs) to summarize (laughs) next we have a question from coralie who asked what is the most random thing you've ever thought about during a match oh my goodness um thing is so many of them happen but obviously they're not very memorable so it's hard to remember um but I've definitely gone through ranges of I mean ranges of food um I think I do think about food quite often and thinking about oh you know what what would I have for dinner tonight or oh I really want to try that for breakfast tomorrow I have kind of these thoughts then I have thoughts um actually now that I have a a dog and dogs now I think about my dogs (laughs) um I uh think about I randomly I just think about any sort of maybe noise I might hear in the crowd or any funny chance or that will sometimes I will sometimes run with that um but yeah very random very random kind of not predictable things that's for sure The next question I've actually had sent through from a few people, but specifically Jemima asked, how are Bono and Gizmo getting along and how hard is it training a new puppy? Um, Well, it's hard, (laughs) but I think there's no way around it. It is hard and it's time consuming. And when I've spoken about it with my older sister, she says that's basically what like what having a child is like. So I think I'm preparing myself for motherhood down the line. No hints there, down the line, <laughs> but definitely some sleepless nights there. Um, but in terms of Bono and Gizmo together, I honestly, I have no complaints. If anything, I think actually Gizmo is more of a bully towards Bono than any other way. Um, the thing is, Bono is quite a sensitive soul. He's, he's very just just really not shy well he's shy with people not with dogs but he's just gentle and he's just really calm gizmo is an absolute tank he is just an absolute bruiser i mean he literally goes for him jumps on him pulls his ears pulls his tail pulls other bits of his body which we won't mention and it's it's actually i'm not sure if i should kind of step in but then i don't at the same time because bono enjoys it so i kind of leave him to it and just let them crack on but they they i have definitely given myself and my boyfriend a lot of very very good laughs because they are brilliant together and finally a question from michael who asked how did you become a u2 fan and have you seen them live um, well, I think I think I became a fan when I was young because I know my mum loved U2 or has always loved U2. So I definitely grew up with that influence from her. My dad also likes them, but definitely the big fan is is my mum. And then I just like 
good music, and I consider them to have good music. I guess I, I I'm just a big fan of their Joshua Tree album. I just yeah no I I, I love their music. And I have been very lucky to have seen them live. I actually got tickets to see them、um, in Dublin back in 2017.、Um, this was actually before I even did well at Wimbledon. And when they actually then invited me, which was kind of a nice coincidence, at, coincidence and as if I'm going to say no to that.、Um, but yeah, so I got to see them there at Croke Park. And honestly, hands down, one of the best concerts I've ever seen. It was just epic. Tens of thousands of people,、um, obviously in their hometown, and it was just an absolute pleasure to be a part of. I also actually got to meet Bono and The Edge.、Um, I usually have、uh, my boyfriend Jackson kind of explain to me what happened because I, I'm pretty sure I kind of blacked out because I was just so excited and, and starstruck. But apparently Bono kissed my hand. I don't have recollection of this, but apparently it happened. So we'll just roll with that. But honestly. It was. They were so incredibly cool, and the whole thing was just proper rock star. It was just so much cooler than tennis players will ever be, really. <laughs> Thanks again to everyone who submitted their questions. I'll be asking for more again soon ahead of the next episode, so make sure you send them in to me via social media. And now we go back to my interview with Claire Williams. If you haven't listened to part one yet, now's your chance to、so、go check it out. You also mentioned how the the races and and your sport in general it's so fast paced. And again, when I'm on court, I'm on my own. I can't really speak to my team. I can hear the crowds, but other than that, I'm very much on my own. But for your drivers who are competing, they can have contact over the radio as well as feeling the car driving, watching out for others, changing settings on the fly.、Mm-hmm. How do they manage to deal with all of these distractions? And how do you support your drivers with This. You know, to be honest, it I have no idea how those guys do what they do in the car,、um, because they, like you say, they have so much going on at any one given time. While all the while having to drive a car at two hundred miles an hour, I, I do find it extraordinary. And these guys, we shouldn't forget, they're really young as well,、um, but they seem to be able to manage it fairly. Easily, it just comes naturally to them, and I think this is what sets them apart: that they're able to be in a car, they're able to take these crazy instructions. I mean, half the time, the language that the engineers use, the codes, and change this button on the steering wheel, and and set this to point three, and talk to X, and you're like, my God, you know. And the driver's doing this while going round Eau Rouge, and you're like, wow. But they just. They're able to do it、um, because it does come naturally to them, and it's those kind of drivers that are able to do that, drive the car, but then also think about what potentially their rivals are doing around them as well. And this is why someone like Lewis Hamilton is so extraordinary because he's just driving, you know, almost with his eyes closed, so to speak. Clearly, he's not、Incredible. doing that <laughs> actually driving with his eyes closed, but、yeah. <laughs> he, he's doing it while all the while thinking about, you know, the tire strategy that Sebastian Vettel's running behind him or. <laughs> Whoever it may be, and that really is what sets the guys apart. Having that capacity to be able to deal with so many different instructions, different situations within a Grand Prix, and still drive the cars in the way that they do. But it does. I think it's an inherent capability that they learn from a very early age. And pit stops are an incredibly important competitive factor of the sport, and something truly amazing to see in person. I was actually blown away when I saw that when I was at Silverstone, and I actually tried a pit stop challenge um, myself um, with, with, with our Fed Cup team, where we actually ch- where、yeah. we actually changed wheels on a real Formula One car. It was、wow. so hard, like no joke. It was so hard、um, for you. What kind of training and planning goes into pit stop and How do you get the pit stop team to be instantly ready for less than two seconds of intense critical action after they've been sat watching the race for a number of laps? Because I noticed they just have to be so quick in getting up and getting ready, and then they're sitting there, and I can see they're sweating. So adrenaline is definitely a part of、yeah. it. How do they? How do you? I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, train for that. Yeah. You, I mean, you saw it, didn't you, Joe? It is. It's、um, an amazing spectacle to watch a pit stop live, and there are so many heroes in our sport. But mostly, people think that our drivers are the heroes, and of course, they absolutely are. But for me, 
our pit stop crews are just um, unbelievable. And there's a huge amount of training that goes on behind the scenes. And we have pit stop rigs at Williams. They do. We have a pit stop practice car. And these guys are doing, guys and girls now, are doing hundreds and hundreds of pit stop practices a year. And that human performance for us is absolutely critical. And we have a whole team that trains them. So they have to they have to do regular um exercise training um, and they do that both at the factory they do it at home and they do it at the racetrack as well so they're running the circuits and they're doing circuit training at the factory and um, they're also um, they do precision training with the pit stop rig that we have at the factory so literally a, a rig flies at them with a tire on it and they one guy's got a gun and another's changing it and they will do it on repeat you know for days oh, and wow. days and days ahead of the start of the season so you know it's not just we take them to a grand prix and you know they're they're there changing the tires and they just happen to do it so much work goes into it, even to the point where we've had people or we still we always have it people looking at the biometrics of these people you know based on someone's body um, shape, size, um, flexibility, they'll be dip, um, put in different positions around the car. Um, so it's all incredibly well thought through. And we had um, Michael Johnson a few years ago um, with his performance center, his, his team came over and we did a lot of work with them in order to look at the pit stop crew and to make sure that we were doing things in exactly the way that we should be based, you know, on people and, and what they're particular skill sets were in the pit stop but what those guys do is incredible and you know they can be doing up to eight pit stops in in one race I remember in the German Grand Prix last year and it was raining and there was so much going on they literally did eight pit stops in one Grand Prix and I think four oh, wow. four of them were sub two seconds so oh, it's, wow. it, it, it is just mind-blowing that you know in the blink of an eye you know, they can change four tyres on a race car. And you know, we have now, so we have actually hospitals that have come to us in the past and asked if we can do some work on them, uh, with with them, um, in order to improve processes that they have in their emergency theatre rooms um, to improve how they all operate within those environments based on our pit stop model. And it's helped, the Cardiff University Hospital um, did that with us a, a couple of years ago and they came in and they watched our pit stop crew and the communications that are used how they used how instruments are laid up and that then translated into the operating theatres that they were running and massively improved their efficiency which was really quite extraordinary that's so incredible I mean, it's literally down to science and it's now literally used in science I mean that's so cool <laughs> exactly yeah so I mean it, it's amazing to watch and they for me like I said they, they're real heroes of the show and but actually you mentioned how how the hospital the Cardiff hospital has has used your methodology and in, in the way they they perform in the operating theater and but that's also not the only way Williams are involved in the medical arena right I, I believe your engineering department have worked on some really amazing projects outside of Formula One is that correct yeah it is we have an advanced engineering um, business um, called Williams advanced engineering um, and that was set up off the back of the hybrid technologies when they came into Formula One um, in 2009. And really what that business does, I mean, it's got 350 engineers working in it now, and they take the technologies that we've developed in in um, Formula One and they commercialize them. And, and we have lots of about 40 or different projects in different sectors. So mostly we work in motorsport and um, the auto industry, but we've got projects in running across defense, healthcare and aerospace. And you know, some of the projects are just quite extraordinary. So we did the I remember Jaguar came to us when they'd been approached by Bond um, to do to produce the baddies car for Spectre. And they oh, so cool. they wanted us to produce this <laughs> this CX75, which we'd already done um, with Jaguar. And they wanted us to make a, a car that had the emissions of a Toyota Prius and the but the power of a Bugatti Veyron. And normally this would take the auto um, industry three or four years to do. And we managed to turn it around in 18 months. And then Bond came along and said, we want that car for Spectre. So, you know, the car that Williams Advanced Engineering did was then used in James Bond. And Daniel Craig said he'd rather have that than the Aston Martin. But then we've done... That's so cool. It's so cool. Did you, did, you, did you get to ride in that car? Uh, I've never had a go in it, uh, no. Oh. But we've got kind of four or five of them at the factory. And what was brilliant was when they came back from filming in um, Rome, I think they'd taken these... We had to make six or seven of them for filming. And they came back and, you know, they'd been through, if you've seen that, that, that uh, scene in Inspector and you see the orange 
CX-75 with the baddie is driving. You know, they, they go through fire, they go through water. <laughs> you know, these cars came back with doors blown off. They came back with burn marks all over them. It was amazing. <laughs> oh, your poor engineers, they must have looked at that and they'll be like, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. What have you done to my beautiful babies? Exactly. <laughs> and I also understand that Williams have a great young drivers program, the Williams Academy, which has been recruiting some incredible drivers, including Jamie Chadwick, who I actually got to meet at Silverstone, which was super cool. Can you tell me about some of the work that goes into that and how it feels he- helping these talented young drivers through their journey in racing? Yes, actually, this is a, a program that was kind of really the brainchild of my husband. We like to keep it in the family at Williams. Um, so we'd always <laughs> we'd always work with young drivers, but never really had um, a properly structured program. And so it was really my husband's idea to put some kind of formal structuring around it and to create an academy whereby we could um, scout for young talent and bring them through and really grow our grow our own. Um, and that's really important to a team like ours, um, to have young talent that we bring through rather than try and recruit within the market and to find the talent um, and really great talent at an early age. And you can do that and then you bring them in and then you're not having to, you know, really, truth be told, pay a load of money for a superstar because you, you've grown your own superstar. So, um, we've started. We started this a couple of years ago, and we now have four drivers within the academy. And like you mentioned, Jamie Chadwick's one of them, and she's um, you know it's fantastic to have a female in it. I'm a huge supporter of women in motorsport. Um, and then Mark has brought in uh, a few others as well. So Dan Tictum's a, a great young talent, and we're really excited to see where he can go. Roy Nasani as well. We did a big launch with him. He's an Israeli driver, so the first Israeli driver. I'm um, in Formula One for many, many years. Oh, wow. Uh, and cool. so it's it's a really exciting project for us because we've brought in so many young drivers, you know, the likes and, and who have gone on to become world champions in our sport. So Jensen Button, Jacques Villeneuve, um, God, the list is Montoya, you know, all these guys that have gone on to do incredible things. Valtteri Bottas, you know, is at Mercedes now. We brought him in. Wow. Um, David Coulthard, you know, all these names, a lot of them have come and through Williams and earned their stripes at Williams. So it's a really important part of what we do, nurturing that young talent and bringing it into our sport. But it's so incredible because that just adds to the multifaceted part of of Williams it's just got it's it's contributing to so many different areas of the sport and also beyond the sport and and that is true legacy I think that's just incredible yeah it really is and you know so the driver academy is a big part of that but then you know I just mentioned about um what we do you know we've got Jamie as you know one of the only females in Formula One these days and find she's not driving but we're facilitating her learning in order to hopefully one day see Jamie driving a Formula One car and promoting women um at Williams is really important to us um and we've done a lot of work on this over the past five years and I my husband gets gets annoyed with me sometimes so I get on my soapbox a bit too much and it's never something that I <laughs> thought I would actually do I've always been quite a chauvinist in my earlier career and actually now you know when you see how few women there are in motorsport and particularly in Formula One I mean it's certainly changed over the past few years and we've seen more and more but you know, it's all about advocacy and you know creating role models um, at the higher echelons of and you'll know this as well Joe. it's so important you know to use your role and your position to do something for for good and for me that's about trying to demonstrate and showcase the fact that Formula One is an incredible world to be a part of and you know both men and women can do that but we need to bring more women into the sport and more women in in higher profile positions so that when you know young girls are tuning into Formula One as we know that they do they actually see that hey it's not just a a world dominated by men and and so I could work in there too so that's something that's really important that we've really started working on and, and promoting from within as well so promoting the female message within Williams and we've actually just last year um, created Women at Williams, which is a whole program based on supporting and advocating women that work for us within our team and helping drive them through their careers. No, for sure. I mean, you know, I think for us in tennis and for me personally, uh, we've been so fortunate, my generation, for the generations that came before and also for, for us to have women like the Williams sisters and and the women that came before her. But for me personally, the Williams sisters who continue to pioneer the sport and, and bring it more and more attention. But 
it's it's to it's for young girls to see the opportunity it's it's not necessarily pushing more women into it it's just for the ones that want to do it can and the ones that are good for them to be successful in and have the opportunity to be just as good as as the men for us obviously it's separate to us but i guess in in motorsport it, it it's it's not separate is it? it it's together right yeah it's absolutely together and you know and and for me as well, as much as you know, it's so important to promote females in engineering and females in motorsport and driving or whatever careers. It, it always has to be based on, you know, meritocracy as well. We are at the highest echelon of motorsport, and you know, we will only ever bring people in that are that are brilliant at what they do. And for us, so therefore, that doesn't matter whatever sex that you are. Um, exactly. you, you've got to be the best that you can be. And actually, Joe, was we watched the other day Battle of the Sexes, um, <laughs> with Billie Jean King's role in tennis. So. Yes. and promoting women in your sport and I found that absolutely fascinating because of these women they are they're such pioneers no, in exactly. their industry and it's you know our responsibility to keep that that message going isn't it no for sure exactly I mean I mean I guess moving on from that but unlike in in my sport in which all players have similar rackets and we use the same balls the car the car for you is such a huge part of the sport and I think a huge part of the thrill I mean it's definitely for me watching how <laughs> would you describe the balance between the driver and the car and how big an impact can each have towards results individually Oh, you see, you're going to get different answers to that question, depending <laughs> on who you ask. You ask a driver and they're like, oh, it's all about the driver, 80 percent, 20 percent about the car. <laughs> you ask anyone that designs and builds that car and they're like totally reverse, 80 percent the car, 20 percent the driver. I find this really, really difficult to answer. And I would love one day for the sport to run a weekend where they flipped the, the cars and the and the drivers. So put Lewis Hamilton and Williams at the back of the grid, which hopefully won't be there much longer. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if you were doing it now, Lewis and Williams and say one of our drivers in a Mercedes, because I think only then can you really, really tell um, the true weighting between a driver and, and a car. But, you know, I think, I think personally for me, if I had to answer that question, I think I would probably say 65, 70% car, yeah. 35, 30% driver, because these guys, they are at the, you know, the top end of what they're doing. They should be able to get into any car, you know, take everything out of it, um, leave nothing on the table uh, you know, and, and put the best job in. But if you haven't got a good car, you're not able to do anything. No, for sure. um, and, you know, these cars, they they are, like you say, I mean, you've seen them, they are extraordinary. Um, they're extraordinary bits of kit. And, you know, there's 25,000 parts, at least, that go into making up these cars. And we're, you know, we're looking at margins and margins of seconds in order to differentiate performance. So, you know, our aero team that really brings the majority of the performance to our car, you know, there's 100 or people in there just trying to find, you know, tenths and tenths of seconds of performance in order to drive us forward up the grid and you know so for me the level of kind of work that's required by so many people just to build a race car um, is incredible and then you've got one driver that's got to get in it over a race weekend and do what you need to do with them but it is a it's a team effort at the end of the day and you've got to have the, the right blend in order to get the best recipe for success. And you weren't always in the position you are in now in the team. How did your career in Formula One start and what roles have you worked in? Oh, gosh. Um, so I, started, <laughs> uh, I rather lucked into a career in motorsport when I left university. I happened to go along to Silverstone um, for, to get some career advice from the MD at the time. And at the time, he said that he happened to have a junior role available in his press office and would I like to give it a go? So I was like, well, I haven't got anything else to do. So that'd be great. Thanks. Um, <laughs> and I so I worked at Silverstone uh, for three years and I loved it. But unfortunately, I was made redundant when Silverstone was sold. And I was devastated, but I did what I always do. And I, I returned to Williams. I'd always worked at Williams in my kind of school holidays in the travel office, yeah. booking hotel rooms <laughs> and hire cars and writing itineraries incredibly badly for our race team. <laughs> Probably just genuinely, genuinely annoying people. Um, but so I went back there and after a few months of working again in the travel office, the head of marketing phoned me and said, our junior press officers just left. I'd like you to do the job. 
But knowing how my dad felt about having his kids work at Williams, my older brother, elder brother was already working at Williams um, permanently. And I said, well, I don't think my dad's going to like that very much if you asked him. And you know, Jim said, no, I haven't, but it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I said, all right, well, okay, you go and phone him up and let me know. And literally within two minutes later, Jim phoned me back and went, yeah, he said, no bloody way, Claire. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he said but don't worry about it I'll work on him and, and a few months later my dad I think after a lot of lobbying from poor old Jim capitulated and agreed to give me a go um, put me on a horrendously long probation period and really thrashed me for the first six months of my time in the press office but I loved it um, you know my job was cutting out press clippings after a race weekend and you know, sorting out the photography and stuff like that. And I, I really worked in the press office, I think, for about eight, nine years, um, just kind of cutting my teeth and earning my stripes. And I started traveling and I started working with the broadcasters and, you know, all the stuff that's involved working in a, a communications team. And I, I absolutely loved it. And But then in 2010, our head of comms decided to leave and our then CEO, CEO asked me if I wanted to do the job. And you know, after eight years, I, I kind of felt that I was ready. So I took that on. And really in the ensuing three years, I got quite a lot of promotions really quite quickly. So I took on the head of marketing role. I then, when we listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, also became the head of investor relations. And then I became director of marketing and communications two years later. So had the full remit for bringing in partners, looking after all our par current partners, looking after all the comms and the brand side of things, so everything marketing related really. And then I was put on the board um, in at the end of that year to represent the family when my father stepped off it. And then in 2013, I was asked if I wanted to be deputy team principal. And I, I thought that was, I thought someone was taking the piss to be quite honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, but it's so incredible. I mean, literally the way you're saying it, you've, you've worked your way fully through the company and there's no really better way. I mean, shy of being the engineer, there's no better way to really, I guess, learn what, what it is that you're running, what it is that you you are uh, trying to nurture as you are now. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's probably what they saw because I because I have grown up within the team um, and I've you know spent so much time in it in my younger days, so to speak, you know, working in the travel office or just hanging around, talking to people. I knew pretty much everybody in the team when I joined. And working in the comms office as well gives you a really good full 360 view of the world in a race team you get to work with the drivers you know I got to work with Frank in fact I was the only one that <laughs> whenever anyone in marketing wanted anything from my dad they would always send me in to go and get it done because <laughs> dad, <laughs> dad had little regard for marketing and comms and so you know an interview request you were the muscle I was the muscle that was sent in to go and <laughs> wrap him around my little finger and to get things agreed to. So it, it really gave me a really good, I suppose, perspective on the whole company because I got to see so much of it in those roles. And because, you know, I love it. And, you know, for us, it's a family business and it's Williams is, you know, Williams. It's it's our brand. It's who we are. And I think no one could care about it more than one of us. And I think that's probably what they saw um, in me and thought, well, let's see how it goes. But it was it was a really difficult decision to take it on because, trying to fill anyone's footstep in anyone's sorry trying to fill anyone's shoes let alone someone like my dad's it felt quite enormous and you know I'd seen the sacrifices that you have to make running a Formula One team and I know you know I'd seen the work involved and you know it was a massive mantle to take on um, but I'm really pleased I did you know despite the lows and sometimes how difficult it can be it's been an extraordinary experience to do it and something that I will never I don't think I'll ever regret having done it put it like that but if I'd have said no I think I would have regretted it no for sure and I mean completely off topic now um <laughs> you may or may not know I absolutely love food and something I found <laughs> no it's true it's true I, I, I'm not even don't we all. something <laughs> <laughs> something I found truly amazing when I came to visit was not just the amazing motorhome I mean, more like motor yeah. mansions, I think, <laughs> that the teams have. But the food you guys were serving was so incredibly yeah. good. I'd honestly recommend Williams <laughs> opening a restaurant. But in all seriousness, how do you keep the team comfortable traveling and how do you keep the food so incredibly good? 
Oh, yeah, we are um, so lucky. The problem is, because our food is so good, you'll start the year a stone lighter than when you finish it. <laughs> because we're so spoiled. But this is another thing that is, it's so important to me that we look after our team. What we're asking them to do can be incredibly difficult. We're asking them to travel around the world for 21 weekends in a year, be away from their family. And while they're away, do incredibly difficult and tough jobs in what can sometimes be really difficult environments. So you think about you know, the days when we used to race in Malaysia, we were racing in, you know, working for a week in 75, 80% humidity, torrential rain one minute, um, brilliant heat the next, you know, what 40 degree heat. Yeah. And these guys, particularly in the garage, they're working in that in really close quarters and they're working for 16 hours a day. And you've got to give them food. You know, to <laughs> my mind, an army marches on its stomach, doesn't it? And Not so you've sure. got to feed them in the right way but also you know we are an independent team and our partners um, are our lifeblood we rely on them to to keep racing so we've got to make sure that we give them great food when they come with us to the racetrack and they have a really great experience and we have a partnership with michael Keynes, who is a wonderful wonderful chef i'm sure a lot of people will know him from master chef and the like um who we've been in partnership with now and he designs all of our menus all of our front of house staff our um, hospitality team are all trained at his um, hotel down in Limpstone um, and we're incredibly proud of that and we're incredibly proud of the hospitality that we have it's it's I suppose it's our shop window as much as our car is our, our shop window on the racetrack behind the scenes our motorhome is our shop window no, for sure for sure that's so incredible and lastly I mean I think it's only appropriate to touch on this but I understand you and Mark are big tennis fans like you said at the beginning but that you have actually been working on your game is that right <laughs> oh dear <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I'd go quite so far as to say working on my game because I don't think I have game <laughs> so, working yeah, well, on getting a game then <laughs> yes yeah, yeah exactly no my husband um I don't know if you know this Joe but he used to play professionally I'm you might know um, actually I don't know so, that <laughs> oh yeah so he used to play professionally he was actually even um offered a place at one of the Ivy League universities in the states on a tennis scholarship oh wow for some bizarre reason he turned it down I think he ended up being Steffi Graf's training partner so he used to go on court um before she used to go out and play her matches something I'm quite proud of and have to tell everybody um <laughs> so I mean he plays I mean obviously not at the moment but four or five times a week and is quite extraordinary oh, that's but, incredible that's yeah, incredible. well so, then then I guess there's two questions to kind of lead on from that when can we play and obviously I guess as a trio with Mark as well yeah. um, when can we play but also when can one of your drivers take me for a spin on the track <laughs> we'll have to do both <laughs> but we don't have a two-seater so I'm not sure how we work that because we're not going to strap you to the bonnet or anything I mean I'm open <laughs> to that honestly I, I I'm game so <laughs> <laughs> we will do a road car experience they're brilliant um going out in a road car with a, a driver on a racetrack is extraordinary but I'd love to um hit some balls with you Joe but I I would be mortified by how embarrassingly bad I am when I first met Mark I, and he told me about his tennis I was like because I played a few games at school was on the team you know I was like yeah yeah you know I'll I'll, I'll kick your ass you know let's go and have a game <laughs> and anyway it, I was mortified and we never played again up until um last year when he finally got me back on the court and so he's been coaching me <laughs> But um, I'd love to have um, yeah, a, a go. That would be great. Oh, no, 100%. I mean, you'll, we'll, we'll have a hit at Wimbledon and then you can, you know, strap me to a car bonnet at Silverstone <laughs> sometime. <laughs> but la uh, lastly, have you ever driven a Formula One car? No. Um, and it's not something that I have any interest in whatsoever. <laughs> so a lot of people do, and it's obviously a question I do get asked. And I don't know, I think... There's a, I have a huge level of competitiveness within me. And if I wasn't any good at it, I'd be horrified. So when I go go-karting, which I do occasionally, and I took the whole team last year and it was brilliant fun. And I thought I was whizzing around, you know, super fast and was going <laughs> to win. And I was like literally the slowest on the scoreboard. And it's like, how does that happen? So if I got in a car and I was slow, it would be so embarrassing. But also, can you imagine if I got in one and I, I crashed it? And you know, my dad's <laughs> going to really, he's not going to be happy. So... <laughs> There's, I will leave that to the professionals. Oh, that's so brilliant. But Claire, honestly, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, it's a, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've, I've really enjoyed it.
Thank you to everyone for listening to episode two, part two. If you managed to stumble across part two first, make sure you go back and listen to part one to hear more of my amazing guest, Claire Williams. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends and follow me across social media at Johanna Conta for more. See you in the next episode.